Just because it's been charging for three days doesn't mean it should actually be able to keep its charge. All right, so let's try one more time. So the, there's not much of a difference between an analytic number theorist and an accountant. The real difference is what we study. So when I'm an analytic number theorist, I have main term and lower order terms. And I try to show the main term dominates over the lower order terms. It's a lot of bookkeeping. Okay, so what we had was we had E n of z was 1 minus z, and then e to the z plus z squared over 2, plus over dot, plus z to the n over n. And then we would often, we showed if the absolute value of z is less than equal to 1 half, then 1 minus e n of z was less than equal to, I think it was e to the z to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 absolute value with a negative sign. We had something like that. Okay. If this is slightly wrong, it's just going to change the argument in a very minor way. The whole point is that if n is very, very large, e n of z is very, very close to 1. And the reason is 1 minus z is e to the log of 1 minus z, which is then e to the z, I'm no, sorry, negative z plus z squared over 2 plus z cubed over 3, going off to infinity. And over here, we have almost the inverse of this. If we went all the way off to infinity, it would be the inverse of this, and then the product of these two things would be 1. But what we really have is we just have a truncation, we start off at z to the n plus 1. Okay? So the question is, this is close to 1. Can we show that the product converges? So now, we have a sequence a n such that the absolute value of a n is tending to infinity. And we want to find a function whose only zeros are located at the a n's. Why do I need to assume the ANs are going off to infinity? No accumulation point. Yeah, no accumulation point. If the ANs were not going off to infinity, I'd have an accumulation point. The function would be identically zero. So we study something of the form, you know, z to the L, and then the product, and it goes from 1 to infinity, of EN of z over AN. And since the absolute value of an is going off to infinity, eventually z over an is less than a half. And if there were a couple of zeros in the beginning, if I had a couple of the terms of the ans were zero, I'm recording that with the z to the l. Why can't I record them with this factor over here? You know, if my function has zeros at the origin, why do I have to split it up in two different ways? become multiplied by 1 for that term? Nope, not multiplying by 1. What would happen if I put an a in equals 0? Oh. Yeah, it blows up, right? I can't have a in equals 0. That would make absolutely no sense. So I have to handle the zeros at the origin separately, and then this is the rest of them. And so we can write this as, you know, z to the l product n goes from 1 to n minus 1 of e n of z over a n, and then a product and goes from n to infinity of e n of z over a n. I can split it like that, and so over here, I can always assume the absolute value of z over the absolute value of a n is less than equal to a half. And it's just very advantageous to split things. Is there anything special about a half for this problem? It's less than 1. Right? That's the only thing that really matters, is I need some number less than 1. A half is just, if you, if you had to write down a number less than 1, a half is probably the easiest thing to write down. I don't really need to study the behavior of this part over here. This is just a finite product. I just need to understand this infinite product over here and see, does this infinite product converge? So, does the infinite product converge? So now, do you want to leave the index starting at big N, or do you want to just switch it to 1? makes no difference to me. 
big n is fine. Big n is fine. So n goes from big n to infinity of e n of z over a n. And so we want to see what that looks like. And so recall <coughs> a product n goes from n to infinity of 1 plus a n converges if the absolute value of a n is always less equal to 1 half and the sum n goes from n to infinity of the absolute value of a n is finite. So we proved this a while ago. We didn't talk about the other direction, but if the sum is finite, then this will converge. Now the worst case you could think of is that there's complete reinforcement. So whenever you're doing problems like this, you always want to do best case, worst case. What's the best case? The best case is all the ANs are positive, and I'm making this as large as possible. What would be the worst case? Or maybe that is the worst case, sorry. That's probably the worst case, right? You know, if this is going to have trouble converging, the trouble converging is when all the ANs are positive and it's being added in that same direction. What's the best case for us? Not alternating. All You're half right. All negative. All negative. Right? If they're all negative, it brings down the product as much as possible. Now the question is, does it bring down the product so much that the product becomes zero? Right. But we saw that if the sum of the absolute values of the ANs is less than infinity, then everything is okay. And we did this by using logs and expanded things out. And so now we want to study this. Well, this is the same. If we take absolute value. This is going to be less than equal to the product and goes from n to infinity of e to the uh, negative z n plus 1 in absolute value divided by n plus 1. And we want to try to understand this. This is the product and goes from n to infinity. Now let's look at the Taylor expansion of e to the negative. So we get 1 minus z to the n plus 1, oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to have over a n plus 1, right? Sorry. e to the negative z over a n, absolute value, to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So we get absolute value of z over a n to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. The next term is going to be a plus z over a n to the 2n plus 2 over n plus 1 squared 2 factorial, yada, yada, yada. If we didn't have any of these other terms here, would the problem be easy? If, we, yeah, if, if, it, if it stopped just right here, would that be easy? It would be fine, it's a, I'm sorry? It would be fine, right? It would be a finite thing inside the product, and would we be okay if we didn't have anything over here? Could we tell if it converged? Yeah. Yes, why? Yeah. This is not, you know, this is uncomfortable, so let's answer quickly. Uh, <laughs> much better. So why would we be okay if we didn't have any of these terms? Because of what we have right above here. Because the absolute value of this, when I sum, is finite. Why? Z over a n is just going to be at most one half. So I have a geometric series. I have even extra decay from this. So if we didn't have any of that extra stuff, we'd be okay. So the question is, how much pollution, how much damage can everything else cause? I don't think it caused that much. So it shouldn't cause that much. And so we want to just estimate what's the best case, what's the worst case scenario. So we need to study the sum, let's do r to the n over uh, n plus 1 to the k over n plus 1 to the k, k factorial negative 1 to the k, k goes from 2 to infinity. And what is R going to equal for us? Just Z over AN. 
That's the term we have to understand. So the best case for us is if um, we have all alternating. So you know, things are canceling, that's good. We can ignore a lot of that and just say, let's forget that we're going to get cancellation from alternating. And we'll say, let's look and see how large the sum could be, and we'll both add it and subtract it and see what we get. So this sum is clearly going to be less than or equal to the sum k goes from 2 to infinity of r to the k over k factorial. Why is that the case? What I have is true, but I actually want to change something. What I have is correct. Why is this true? Well, because when you reduce the power of r, you know that r is in less than the one half. Oh, so I dropped the n plus one. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So. Um, but yes, actually, it would still be better to do that. Well, then you just. I mean, yeah, you're just decreasing the denominator. So. I'm just decreasing the denominators. So, there's one thing to be careful about. This is both positive and negative. And so when I go from this, this is definitely true, because here I could have some cancellation. What's true is something even stronger, putting in absolute values like this. The absolute value of that sum is still like this. So what this does is it allows me to see which, how much of a contribution can I have from these pieces. I can then add it, and I can subtract it. Adding it will make the product as large as possible. Subtracting it will make the product as small as possible. Okay. I can do even more here. This is less equal to the sum k goes from 2 to infinity of r to the n plus 1 to the k over 1. I'm just throwing away a lot of the cancellation, a lot of the decay that I have in the denominator. I don't need it. You should think of r as a small number, because the a n's are going off to infinity. You know, I'm telling you, r over a n is at most, I'm sorry, z over a n is at most a half, but really, is it like a half full long? No, it could be, it could be, you know, 20 quadrillion terms. But eventually, it's going to zero. So, this is of size z over a n to the n plus 1. This is the square of that. If this is small, this is you can use whatever strong <coughs> adjective you want. Smaller. 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 <laughs> so strong. <laughs> and the next one would be even smaller. I can't say small, it's because we have infinitely many. So in terms of just how bad things can be, I don't really need the extra decay from the k factorial. In fact, almost all the contributions coming just from this error. All the other ones are even smaller. So this is going to be, now it's a geometric series formula, this is going to be r to the n plus 1 squared over 1 minus r to the n plus 1. Okay, I want to get rid of that r. I know r is at most, is at least a half. So this should be less than equal to 2 r to the n plus 1. Oh, so it's two, uh, squared. Why can I go from here to here? You're just putting the denominator, yeah. your denominator and turning it into a 2. Okay, but why can I turn it into a 2? So I know r is at most a half. I have 1 minus r to the n plus 1. So that's at most a half. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, to make this as large as possible, I want n to be 0. I want to subtract off the largest thing I can. When n equals 0, I subtract off 1 minus r. So I subtract off 1 minus a half, it becomes a 2. As n is even larger, I have even more decay. What you want to do is you want to be as lazy as possible as long as possible. Right? You don't want to do detailed analysis if it's not necessary. If you have so much convergence, there's no need to be very careful and do a lot of detailed bookkeeping. For problems like this, I can be extremely crude and still get a nice result. And so here, I get an error of size 2 to the r to the n plus 1 squared. If I looked over here, my next term is going to be you know, r to the n plus 1 
I have over 2, I have an extra n plus 1 squared. I could have kept that n plus 1 squared if I wanted, and just, you know, the n plus 1 to the k, I could have replaced all of them with n plus 1 squared. I could have kept that factor of 2 over there. And so with a little bit of work, I could have gotten a better number here. I don't need a better number. Or I should probably say, we don't need a better number. Right? This is more than enough. If I now look at the product, the product n goes from n to infinity of 1 minus z over a n to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus yada yada yada. What's the best this could be? This is less than equal to the product n goes from n to infinity of 1 minus z over a n to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus z over a n to the n plus to the 2n plus 2 with a factor of 2. You know, the worst case is if I add everything. The best case is if I subtract everything. So I'm only going to do one of the cases. You know, I'll do this case because we want to show the product is finite. And as long as we can show the product is finite, we win. Okay. So now we have you know, the product n goes from n to infinity of 1 minus z over a n, I'm just rewriting it to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, plus z over a n to the 2n, oh it, oh it is, n plus 1 squared over, oh I'm sorry, no, not over, times 2. could this be? What do we know about z over a n? It's at most a half. So I have this to the n plus first power squared. I can take one of them to the n plus first and replace it with one half to the n plus one. So I can use z over a n is less than equal to one half to the n plus one. I'm sorry, what one half? If I want to be even cruder, I could even replace it with a half. Am I throwing away a lot of information when I do that? Kind of. Kind of. You know, at some point, you should start to be a little bit upset over how much we're throwing away. This is kind of excessive, because you know, n is getting really, really large. Now, all of a sudden, I'm just bounding this with one half. If I were to plug that in here, the one half would cancel with the two. I'd have one minus this plus something like this. I'd still be okay. It would still converge. It would no longer be close to the correct value. I don't care. Right now, I'm not trying to compute what it converges to. I'm just trying to show, does it converge? So, you know, you get to vote again. Super crude or moderately crude? Moderately. Moderately crude? We'll do moderately crude. A little bit more work, but... Super crude was, would have been the nicer thing to say. <laughs> so we get 1 minus z over a n to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And now, this is going to be at most 1 half to the n plus 1. The 2 cancels with the 2. You get plus 1 half, or 1 over 2 to the n, z over a n to the n plus 1. And now you can see why super crude was better than moderately crude, because then I could just easily uh, combine them. That's not a big deal. I have 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 over n plus 1. What can I say about that number? So I'm trying to see, I, I want to show that this product is, is finite. All we need is this product is finite. Well, we have that the, the one, 1 over 2 to the n is going to be a lot smaller than 1 over n plus 1. So Correct. It's going to be a higher negative term there. So there's going to be a higher negative term. Uh, 
So it takes, it takes a while to get really comfortable doing these calculations. This is why I wanted to do this today. I want to show this product is finite. All I have to do is get upper bounds to show the product is finite. What would be a good upper bound? You know, I've got 1 over 2 to the n, and I've got negative 1 over n plus 1. I've got to find some nice way to combine them. There is a nice way to combine them. Any thoughts on how I should combine them? Go back to the simple method and then combine them easily. We're committed. We're not going to give up. That's retreating. You know, let the Hun retreat. We advance. Anybody see pattern? Okay. We don't want to retreat. We've committed ourselves to making this approach work. Doesn't matter how painful it is. We're not going to give up. I just need an upper bound. I need an upper bound for this. I'm sorry? Well, so the whole thing would be less than equal to c over a to the n plus 1. You just wait over and over Then you say... Okay, be, be very careful. Okay, give it to me. So it's this equal to the product n goes from n to infinity of what? 1 minus mm -hmm. uh, absolute value of z over a okay. to the n plus 1. That you can do. Well, no, because now you've dropped this. This is positive. So you've made the factor smaller. You're giving me a lower bound now. Plus. <laughs> right, if you give a plus, then we're back to here. <laughs> so it's okay to go around in circles when we're doing contour intervals. <laughs> this is not the time to go around in a circle. I want progress. <coughs> or. Okay. Um, Okay, so what, what's what's a bound? One plus one over two to get. So one bound is just one plus one over two to the n, you know, z over a n to the n plus one. It's just drop the middle term. And does that sum convert? Does that product converge? Yeah, this is basically this is bounded by a half. This is a geometric series. So, okay by old result. You all missed an easier bound. There's an easier bound than this. Yes. And no, you may show me with a finger, but not with that finger. Okay. What is the bound? Yes, good finger. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's less than equal to the product, and goes from n to infinity, of 1. Right? <laughs> this is the reason I wanted to do this problem. Okay? There's a lot of estimates you can make. What's your goal? If your goal is just to show that it converges, if it's just to find an upper bound, why be clever? Uh, how many of you remember all these results in calculus that, you know, if you have a continuous function on a closed bounded set, it attains its maximum? So how would you like to work in industry and your boss tells you, okay, I want you to tell me what our company should do. And you, two days later, you come back to your boss. I proved there exists an optimal strategy for our company. <laughs> if you want to be working there tomorrow, what question must you be prepared to answer? <laughs> and that optimal strategy is, right? For a lot of things, we want to know what's the optimal. Or can you give me a value that's close? Can you tell me roughly where I need to be? Can you tell me roughly how much money we'll be making? I want to know, is this investment worth doing? Uh, we, we've done the calculation, and there will be some amount of money that we will make if we do this investment. Great. I, can, you know, I want to know, should I do this investment or this one? This is not going to give us a really good estimate for what the product is, but it will prove that the product converges. How do we do a better estimate? Don't be so crude. Right? The better we are, the less crude we are. I mean... 1 over 2 to the n, uh, negative 1 over n plus 1, you can do some work with this. The 1 over 2 to the n doesn't really make much of a difference here. And so you can play some games. And you can probably replace this with 1 over 2n plus 2, something like that. And that would be a much better estimate. So again, all we wanted to do was show the product converge. We had a sequence of upper bounds. If we want to show that the product converges to something non-zero, all we need is a sequence of lower bounds. 
And so what would happen is rather than adding all of this, we would subtract all of this. And so we wanted a lower bound. So now lower bound. It would be something like this. Okay? Alright, so now we know that this is at most a half. Question? Yeah, sorry, what did we uh, what did we just show? What was the sum up there using the um using the yeah, the one and then Okay, we just took our initial sum, mm -hmm. I mean our initial product, and we showed it was bounded. Okay. So the product will converge. And so we're just using the, the fact that if the sum of the absolute value of a n is less than infinity, then the product of 1 plus a n converges. And now we're, showing and now we're trying to show that it doesn't converge to 0. Okay. If, it, if it converges to 0, this is not going to be a valid solution to the problem. We want a function that only vanishes at the prescribed zero, so a1, a2, a3, a4. So we need to show that the infinite product is not 0. So we went through and we saw how large this could be, and then rather than adding it, now we subtract it. So if we subtract it, now we have uh, 1 minus blah, minus 2 times blah. And now we want to figure out how you know, small could this be. And so now we're going the other direction. I would now let's look at this. So again, if we replace all of this with 1 half, we're replacing it with something that's bigger. If we replace it with something that's bigger, we're making this large, we're subtracting off, we're making it even smaller, that's good. So this should be less than equal to the product, and it goes from n to infinity, 1 minus z over a n to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, minus uh, z over a n to the n plus 1. And now we just need to understand this. So, how large is negative 1 over n plus 1 plus negative 1? So I need a lower bound now. So what would be a good lower bound? So again, be crude. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, mm. I have negative 1 over n plus 1 minus 1. So that's negative n plus 2 over n plus 1. Mm. And I want something smaller than that. So 0 would be larger than this. 0 is too big. Negative 1 is too big. I'm sorry? Negative 2. Yeah, negative 2. This is greater than or equal to negative 2. <coughs> and so this whole thing here, it's greater than or equal to the product. n goes from n to infinity of 1 minus 2 z over a n to the n plus 1. And in fact, z over a n is at most a half. So I think I can probably kill the plus 1 and the 2. Because if I bump this up to a half, I'm making this more negative. That's going to make it smaller. So this would be greater than or equal to the product, n goes from n to infinity, of 1 minus z over a n to the n. Does that product converge? And now all we need to do is make sure that it doesn't converge to zero. Well, the only way a product like this will converge to zero is if one of the terms is zero because this has such rapid decay. So you can now estimate you know, how much this would be. And we can now do this using standard logs. Okay. So this is the bookkeeping as to how you would do this. Now do you understand why in math books people just write, one can see that, it follows that, the other terms are small, and after some algebra, one sees. You, you want to get to the point where you can do that. You don't want to do this again and again and again. The more of these problems you do, the easier it becomes, the more second-hand it becomes. And so, if you want to do more of these problems, I'm happy to give you some assignments to do, and I'm happy to check them. I don't like giving 
lots of homework problems because that forces everybody to do them. If you want to become proficient in a skill like this, you have to do a bunch of problems. Email me, I'm happy to give you some additional problems to look at. Some of you might go into algebra, where you will probably never have to do this again. Some of you might even go further afield and say, and get out of mathematics. Okay. <laughs> Let's all look at the leap. Okay. So, the question is, you know, what, what is useful about this? The main idea here is the idea of laziness, of being as crude as you can and getting away with things. Don't try to be exceptionally clever if you don't need to. Try to get a sense of what level of a bound do you need for the problem. How hard do you have to think about something? That's really good advice that can be used for lots of different problems. Yes? So, uh, my memory might just be bad, but why was it that we wanted... What was it we were trying to show with this product? Or so, not that we were trying to show the conversion or that, but what was, why were we trying to do that? What, what, what problem well, were we trying to solve? So we're trying to solve, you know, given a sequence of locations for zeros, okay. can I build a function that's zero there and nowhere else? Oh, I see. So we want to show that this product, which is going to become our sequence... Right. Is, it's going to become our function. We want to show that this, yeah. that this product is finite, and that this product is not identically zero. Got it. And so the first time we looked, we looked at things like z minus a n and z minus a n blew up. So we said, well, let's look at 1 minus z over a n. And you know, 1 minus z over a n had much better properties. Okay, everybody comfortable with the algebraic nightmare? So this is the careful bookkeeping. So in some sense, it's a little bit like some of the contour integrals we did, where we had to split a contour into parts. You know, we had one problem, I think, where we had a contour like this. And we had to stay away from you know, I, uh, e to the i pi over 4. And the distance we had to stay away was some function of the radius. And we had a problem like that. And I think we had another contour once where it was something like this. And we had to stay away from the very ends because we wanted to have the exponential decay. And as long as we moved up just a little bit, everything was fine. It's very similar in spirit to stuff like this. And when you're doing these analyses, well, in the limit as r goes to infinity, all I need is decay. Do I need to know how quickly it goes to zero? Not unless I'm actually going to numerically approximate the value of the integral by, you know, calculating these things. All I need to know is in the limit it goes to zero. Is it worth spending my time to get the best possible error estimate for here? No. Once I have something that's going to zero, I win. I don't need something that goes to zero faster than something else. Great. You know, we can have these you know, contests to see who can get the best decay you know, when you chop it off. But it's not going to make any difference at the end of the day. At the end of the day, the integral over that arc is going to zero. If you were numerically approximating things, you might want to know how rapidly is it going to zero so you could estimate what your answer is. You should view everything we're doing here in that light. So I want to just write down just one part. So the sine of pi z over pi is the product and goes from 1 to infinity. I'm going to deliberately make a mistake. So this should have a mistake in it. Yes. So this is not sine pi z over pi. Z. Yes. So we have to put in the z here. So when you look at this function, where does the right-hand side vanish? Right-hand side is 0 at z equals 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. That's looking a lot like the sine function. And you know, we had to deal with you know, the Weierstrass product. Now, if you look at this, this is very different. We don't have the exponential factors. So the exponential factors is enormous overkill. I think we talked about like, thermonuclear warheads to kill little fleas. If you look at the ENs, when we're taking our product for the nth zero, we're looking at the nth Weierstrass product. This is telling us you don't need to do that. You can actually do it essentially with the zeroth, I'm oh, sorry, with essentially the zeroth Weierstrass product. You don't need exponential factors because you have great convergence. 
can somebody give me another way of writing this product? So rather than proving the sine formula for you, I want to just analyze the sine formula. What's another way of writing this product? How else could I write it? Yeah. The product n goes from minus infinity to infinity of 1 minus z over n. I'm sorry? Without zero. Without zero. So why don't I write it like that? Other than the danger that I will forget to remember that I will forget to write n is not zero. Does that seem like a nicer way of writing it? Because then you can quickly look at this and see, oh, it's zero whenever z is an integer. Here I have to solve z squared equals n squared. That's an odd one. Why is one way better than another? Any thoughts? Yes. Well, at the bottom, I mean, it should be like the limit of a, a sequence of partial products. Okay. And so which one is it on the bottom? Okay, so one thing is it could matter maybe how I'm doing my products minus infinity to infinity. I now have two ways to extend. But why else? And poor Umang is at a disadvantage here, so I will give Umang the same advantage everybody else has. Okay? So, why is this a bad way to write things? How do you tell if a product converges? Yes. Yeah, the top one converges because of that. Right. The, this one converges because if I let my a n be, I'm going to be a little bit careful now, but essentially if I let z be z squared and a n be 1 over n squared, I can use my previous result. I'm just applying it at the point z squared. So then the one on the bottom is the harmonic function. The one on the bottom is the harmonic function which diverges. Now, it's conditionally convergent. So if I put in absolute value signs, all hell breaks loose. If I don't put in absolute value signs, I have alternations. And in fact, this will make sense if you go, um, if you match things in pairs. The problem is, if I go from maybe negative 5 million to a million, I have a huge number of just negative terms, and they all have the same sign, and that drags things down. And that's the difficulty, is the harmonic series does not converge. So here z equals z and a n equals negative 1 over n. I guess here would be negative. I'm writing things. And it's actually not going to converge as we have some issues. So what we're doing is we're matching things in pairs. So we match 1 minus z over n with 1 minus z over negative n. And if we multiply them together, that yields 1 minus z squared over n squared. Because this becomes 1 plus z over n. So what we're doing is we're grouping things in a very intelligent way so that the divergence is actually balanced out. This is equivalent to symmetrically going to infinity. To going from negative n to positive n. If you do something like that, you'll be okay. But the difficulty is when I have something like this, I'm not sure how I'm going off to infinity. Okay? This should be one other thing that you should be curious about in this expression. <coughs> why not sine z? I'm sorry? Why not sine z? Why not sine z or why the pi's? <laughs> right? Well, I can understand why I want pi z, because I want the function to be vanishing at the integers. That's much nicer to write. Why do I want pi down below? Well, I know I can write sine pi of z as basically a Weierstrass product. This is actually a little bit better than what we proved in that I don't need the exponential factors. But how much could I be off by when I do this? If I tell you the zeros, does that uniquely specify the function that vanishes there and nowhere else? I could be off by an exponential. I could be off by an exponential of the holomorphic function. In this case, the exponential of the holomorphic function turns out to be a constant and turns out to be pi. It's very, very nice. 
okay? And then the question is just, you know, why is it pi? If I could figure out one value of z to evaluate this at, let's say we know it's, a, it's off by a constant, but we don't know what constant it is. Okay? That's a big assumption. Okay? I don't mind making a big assumption. Let's make a big assumption. Let's say we know we're off by a constant. All I need to do is figure out this value at one point and this value at the same point, and then we can figure out what that constant is. What point should I try? Zero. Zero. One half. One half. So why can't it be zero? Because it zero. Right. So unfortunately, <coughs> if I evaluate at zero, I get zero equals zero, and I won't be able to detect the constant. So I have to try something else. Why are you trying one half? Because I expect the value to be one times whatever that constant we were looking for. Ah, okay. And we can still compute the sine of pi times one half easily, and the hope is that this will be next. So we get the sine of pi over 2 divided by pi, sounds like you know, walkie versus a polycube versus 1 half, the product, n goes from 1 to infinity, 1 minus 1 over 4 n squared. So now you've got to figure out what does that product equal. Alright, sine of pi halves is? So we have 1 versus pi over 2. I'll just bring the pi over. And now we have the product n goes from 1 to infinity 4n squared minus 1 over 4n squared. Does 4n squared minus 1 look familiar? We might have done this in probability last year. I'm not positive. How can you write 4 n squared minus 1? Okay, so this is now pi halves. The product n goes from 1 to infinity of 2 n minus 1, 2 n plus 1. How should I write the denominator? Right. 2 n squared, 2 n times 2 n. So let's just start writing out a few terms. We get 1 versus pi halves. Right, when n equals 1, it doesn't vanish. It's good. Right? So we get 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 plus 1 is 3 over 2 times 2. The next term, now n becomes 2. We get 4 minus 1 is 3. Um, 5 over 4 times 4. So who was saying whoosh, whoosh, no whoosh, whoosh. If there was whoosh, whoosh, we'd be in trouble. So prove to me that we can't have whoosh, whoosh. Well, we could. No. No, because the top is the draw and the bottom Oh, yeah. If we have whoosh, whoosh, we're basically having like ratios of two integers. It's unlikely we're going to be getting a beautiful thing like pi over two. With just the limit of a ratio of two integers that should be very close to each other. So the next term is going to be... Seven times nine over eight times eight, nine times eleven over ten times ten. I'm sorry. It's sort of converging to like one. Yeah, you know, it dips down a little bit, then it comes up, and it goes down, and it converges to pi halves times two over pi. <laughs> so this is known as Wallace's formula. There's lots of different formulas for pi. This is a beautiful formula for Wallace's formula. So my problem the, uh, the, the product converges to pi. The product or the product converges to two over pi. The product converges to two over pi. That's why I wrote it as pi halves oh, yeah. over pi. So did I did I give a discussion on this in 341 last year? I don't think so. Okay, this, there's too many things to do in 341. There's a way to prove this from the normalization constant of a uh, the student t distribution. So I, I will include a proof. I have a paper 
I think it was the first paper I published with my Williams affiliation. It's a short note in the uh, monthly where using the fact that the student T distribution has a normalization constant of 1, you can actually deduce Wallace's formula. You may have seen another formula for pi. And you're just, you know, we've got a few minutes left. It's, you know, it's not bad to just know a couple of different formulas for pi. So I will, for those interested, I will give you a handout uh, that shows you that this actually does converge to 2 over pi. And now we've shown at one place that the two of them are equal, which is great. How many of you have seen the Gregory Leibniz formula? We have about five minutes left, so I'm going to have to borrow. Does anybody have an engineering cap on them? It allows me to do anything I want without justification. See. An, econom <laughs> an economist's cap is almost as good. <laughs> What's the integral from 0 to 1 of bx over 1 plus x squared? Arc tangent. Minus arctangent. Did I prove in class why the derivative of arctangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared? I don't um, think so. No. no. Okay. So what angle has a tangent of 1? 45 or pi over 4. What angle has a tangent of 0? 0, right? You want sine over cosine to be 0. So this is just pi over 4. What does this look like? If you want, I'll write it in a more illuminating manner. What does that look like? Looks like one of those line integrals we did a while ago. <laughs> no, well, not necessarily, because it's only going from 0 to 1. If I went to uh, infinity, I'm sure. Mistake. If I went to infinity, sure. When you see 1 over 1 plus x squared, where could that have come from? Cauchy. Not Cauchy. I mean, it's a Cauchy distribution. But where did... Where did oh, I'm sorry? A log. Not a log. Where have you seen something like 1 over 1 plus x squared? Yes! Oh, cool. <laughs> I'll write it in a far more illuminating fashion. 1 minus negative x squared dx. This is a geometric series. So it's the integral from 0 to 1, the sum, and it goes from 0 to infinity, negative x squared to the n dx. What's the integral of a sum? Well, we <laughs> <laughs> it, it may be tough to see on the, on the camera, but well, I'm wearing my, the sum of the now. integrals. I'm wearing my engineering <laughs> economist's hat, right? Oh my god. The I actually. <laughs> was at a yard sale at Princeton uh, this weekend, and I actually found a Princeton University press hat for an embarrassingly small amount of money. But it does not give me the power to do what I want. So I really need the strength of one of these hats. I'll pull out the negative 1 to the n, x to the 2 n dx. You can justify this. You've got to be careful justifying this. Why do you have to be careful? What's the difficult place? 1. If I take x equals 1, I get basically 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1. What am I trying to expand when x equals 1? I'm trying to expand 1 half. Well, if you look at what's 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1? Yeah, I call it a half. <laughs> it's 1 half the time, it's 0 the other half of the time. On average, the partial sums are 1 half. There are ways to make this rigorous. Complex analysis is sometimes used to make these things rigorous. You should really integrate to 1 minus epsilon, and then take the limit as epsilon goes to 0. <coughs> so if you want to make things rigorous, go up to 1 minus epsilon, then everything is fine. You can put in absolute values and it converges, and then take the limit. So, no, go to 1 minus epsilon, send epsilon to 0. All right, we'll pretend we did that. All right, we have the sum n goes from 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n. What's the integral of x to the 2n from 0 to 1? Over 2n plus 1. 
So we get 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh plus a ninth is pi over 4. That's the Gregory Leibniz formula for pi. So if you ever need to calculate pi and you don't have a calculator on you, well, or maybe you only have a calculator that can do you know, simple quotients and adding, here is a simple way to calculate pi. Or you could also use the Wallace part of it. I mean, you, you, you might have seen it in a, in a class. I'm trying to think of that. Yeah. You know, in a calculus class, they might have shown you. Uh, sometimes I do this when I teach probability. Last year, I decided not to. Mm -hmm. I wanted to eat M&Ms instead. Uh, <laughs> this is a great formula for pi. So now, in grad school, we sometimes play the game, which professor would win in a number? I don't know if you guys play that. If you do, I don't want to know what the results are. <laughs> Which formula do you think wins? The Gregory Leibniz <coughs> or the Wallace? And how do you determine what I mean by wins? So which one converges to? Yeah, which one converges, converges to? Okay. So this is 